Welcome to Law You Should Know. The law affects every aspect of our lives, our home, our jobs, and our recreational activities. Now you can learn about the law and how to protect yourself against the loss of your liberty or property. Learn how to stand up for your rights and seek compensation when you have been wronged. Your host for Law You Should Know is attorney Kenneth J. Landau with the Mineola Law Firm of Shane, Docks, Denise, and Corker. He's a member of the Committee on Professional Ethics of the Bar Association of Nassau County and counsel to the Nassau Academy of Law. And now, here is your host for Law You Should Know, attorney Kenneth J. Landau. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome to Law You Should Know. My guest today is Kevin P. McMullen. He's an attorney, and he has an advanced degree in international legal studies. He's also a retired Army reservist who achieved the rank of lieutenant colonel in the infantry and a graduate of senior service schools in all three services. He's also a ghostwriter, and finally, he's a legal scholar. And that's why we've invited him back to Law You Should Know to discuss with us the summary jury trial. Attorneys can also receive CLE credit by listening to this program. We'll give you the details later on. Kevin, welcome back to Law You Should Know. Thank you, Ken, and thank you for inviting me. And the summary jury trial is very important to our listeners and also attorneys out there. Why is it so important? Because it's really the salvation of the civil jury system. I'd like to um, explain this, the summary jury trial th- as thoroughly we can in the two, in the hour we have. So I've uh, divided my presentation into three parts: an introduction, a closer scrutiny of the system, and then our experience with the system and and further advice for attorneys. So with the introduction, I'd like to define a summary jury trial. That would be clever. Uh, then explain how it's response to a need and how the courts are promoting the summary jury trial. So, the definition. A summary jury trial is a complete civil trial from jury selection to verdict conducted in a single day. Let's refine that definition. First, it's not necessarily a trial of every element, but that's true in an ordinary trial. The judges can narrow the issues. And, of course, we have bifurcated trials. It could be about a summary jury trial about liability or damages or about both, depending on the complexity of the situation. It can be binding or non-binding. If it's binding, there's a verdict. And if it's non-binding, you get a decision that leads to further negotiations. We also have two patterns of summary jury trials in New York. There's the Chautauqua pattern, the original one. That's from the far upstate county of Chautauqua. And in that case, when you get a verdict, there are only four limited grounds for appeal. I'll go into those later, but definitely not, not that the verdict was contrary to the weight of the evidence. In the other kind, exemplified by Bronx County, there is no appeal on any grounds. The two parties simply exchange general releases and stipulations of discontinuance. The uh, rules of evidence for a summary jury trial are often um, stated as being relaxed. That's true to an extent, but it's misleading. You think of the documents that presented in a summary jury trial as uh, analogous to the documents presented in a motion for summary judgment. Uh, you don't have the doctor present at the motion for summary judgment. You has, have his certified report. Or you have the uh, certified depositions of various other witnesses. You have uh, different uh, documents and reports, whether from the police or the hospital. And the documents presented in the summary tr- jury trial are very much like that. In the Bronx, they don't necessarily have to be certified unless there's a dispute as to their authenticity. However, the essential rules of evidence are still applicable. We all know that uh, in a hospital record, you could introduce the statement that the uh, patient said he was run over by an auto, because that's relevant to the diagnosis. However, you could not admit, uh, even if it's in the record, that he was run over by an auto that ran through a red light. Judge uh, Joseph Girassi the first statewide coordinator for summary jury trials, was actually reversed on this ground. 
that he introduced reports that he shouldn't have. There were reports of treating physicians and a radiologist that were produced long after the pretrial deadline. He also admitted an ex parte and unsworn video of an interview with a treating physician. It was really very good of uh, Justice Gerasi to introduce those, um, not to introduce those, but to and send me the uh, transcript of the trial uh, for which he was reversed. That's a public-spirited man and is more humility than I may be qua- capable of. A summary jury trial may be limited to a single crucial issue. could be all issues, typically in an auto accident, or in the um, case Judge Jurassi tried where an old lady claimed she was hit on the head by the garage door in a service station. It could be more limited in a medical malpractice uh, trial. It could be, was there informed consent? or the time that the mother arrived in the emergency room and therefore whether the hospital performed the cesarean section in time. It could be simply on liability and conscious pain and suffering. If the medical expenses and the lost wages have been stipulated or decided in a motion for summary judgment. New York has explicitly expanded the purview of the summary jury trial recently to include commercial divisions of Supreme Courts in the counties that have such a division. For example, uh, was the fruit when it arrived rotten? Was the transistor radio according to specifications when the case of them was delivered? The ADR subcommittee uh, of the commercial uh, division committee has conferred with the justices and they think that commercial trials would be perfectly appropriate. A summary jury trial, you must understand, though, is not small claims court. A summary jury trial is convened in the Supreme Court, in some cases the county court, and the Supreme Court has, of course, unlimited jurisdiction. In New York, there have been plaintiff's claims and summary jury trials for half a million dollars and a recovery of $107,000. Often in these cases, also, there's a high-low agreement. There are historical antecedents, of course, to the summary jury trial. The Athenians had a similar one-day civil trial. Each side began with an opening statement. Then the clerk read the affidavits of the various witnesses, and each side made a closing statement before the jurors voted on the cause of action. And some judges, of course, in New York have oral arguments on motions for summary judgment. In a summary jury trial, you add the witnesses and the jury in questions of fact, but of course, in a motion for summary judgment, you're really dealing with the facts, too, as to whether there is such a question of fact. I just want to remind our listeners that we are listening to Kevin P. McMullen, and he's talking to us about the summary jury trial. And as you'll continue to hear, it's a very important tool in resolving civil jury trials throughout the state of New York. Thank you, Kevin. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, The summary jury trial is a response to a need, the need to provide each litigant with his day in court. The late Judge Edward Ray wrote about the vanishing trial, and Professor James Maxiner of the University of Baltimore Law School has written about and lectured about the ten ways the courts in Germany are superior to the courts in the U.S., and two of those reasons are time and court, time and cost. There is a growing number of summary jury trials in New York. According to the current statewide coordinator, Justice Lucindo Suarez, there have been at least 6,328, perhaps 7,000 or 8,000, because all counties don't report the data. Currently, they're uh, concentrated in the five boroughs of New York and surrounding counties. The courts are trying to promote the summary jury trial. Uh, I first became aware of it when I saw a copy of the Jury Pool News. Uh, Justice Gerasi came all the way from Chautauqua to New York to give a CLE program. And you can consult uh, Chapter 9A of Tom Moore's book, Evidence and Negligence Cases. There's an enormous chapter with transcripts and all possible forms on summary jury trials. And Wes McKinney's forms for the CPLR, Volume 4, has an article by Professor Joseph Marino with many forms. Various counties now have rules and bar associations have uh, uh, recommended procedures. 
Justice Luindo, Lucindo Suarez took over from Judge Carassi as the statewide coordinator. I was worried at the f- uh, first when the change came, but Justice Suarez, who sits in the Bronx, has really been a workhorse. He's given more than 100 lectures and brought Judge Gerasi down from the Bronx to try cases, and he's compiled statistics. So let's go on to the second part, part two, closer scrutiny of the summary jury trial. Here we have a more precise description of the summary jury trial in 11 steps. Step one is the voir dire by the judge with a standard list of questions for that type of case, much briefer than usual. The attorneys then have 10 minutes to supplement the judge's question but not engage in extended rehabilitation of witnesses, or excuse me, of jurors. The court may, of course, schedule the voir dire for the day before, allowing the attorneys more time. Step two is a 10-minute opening statement by each attorney, and it can be argumentative, unlike a regular trial. Step three is the lengthy one. That is one hour for each attorney to present evidence. This can also be mildly argumentative. He may examine two witnesses, previously identified, of course. He may cross-examine the opposing witnesses, but the time he spends cross-examining those counts as part of his hour. He may introduce and explain various documents and reports, police reports, medical records of all types, uh, economic damages for loss of income, pay stubs, tax returns, uh, 1099 forms. If there's a question of inflation or lost opportunity be figured into the damages, there must be expert testimony or an expert certified report. He can even introduce documents from prior litigation or injuries to explain away the uh, supposed injuries of the plaintiff in the current case. As I said, he can present excerpts from depositions, including ones from prior trials, and cleverly may substitute excerpts from depositions in that case for cross-examination of the plaintiff's live witnesses if that witness has testified in the summary jury trial. Quoting from part of the deposition where he cross-examined that witness will be a lot quicker than trying to cross-examine the witness again. The proponent will, in any case, will provide loose-leaf binders of all these documents for the court, the opposition, and the jury. As a matter of practice, there should be a uh, binder for each member of the jury. However, when he's addressing the jurors during his hour, he may display the documents in turn on an overhead projector so the jurors are really concentrating on his presentation and not fiddling through the loose-leaf binders. Kevin, we're just going to continue with our steps. We have to take a little station break. Right. And when we return, Kevin will continue with the steps of a summary jury trial. We're talking about the summary jury trial in civil litigation. You're listening to 90.3, the voice of NASA Community College, and also over the Internet at nccradio.org. We'll be back in a moment. Nassau County Bar Association, who wants you to know about ADR, Alternate Dispute Resolution, which can help you avoid costly, lengthy, and uncertain litigation in court. By resolving disputes through mediation or arbitration, it gives you control over who decides your case. A mediator helps all parties to reach an agreement they can live with, or an arbitrator selected by the parties hears and decides the case. Your attorney can still represent you, but you control who decides your case. ADR is faster and less stressful than fighting in court, and it is a great way to resolve divorce, employment, or commercial disputes. ADR is now offered through the Nassau County Bar Association. Find out more about how ADR can help resolve your dispute by calling 516-747-4070 or visit NassauBar.org. Once again, we continue with Law You Should Know. From the Mineola Law Firm of Shane, Dox, Denise, Corker, and Sauer, here is attorney Kenneth J. Landau. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome back to Law You Should Know. This particular program is eligible for CLE credit through the Nassau Academy of Law. Please contact them by going to nassaubar.org and record the code at the end of the show. Kevin McMullen is going to continue his presentation about the steps involved in the summary jury trial. Thank you, Kevin. 
Thank you, Ken. I was discussing a, a more a closer scrutiny of the summary jury trial in 11 steps. I was on step three, the biggest one, which is the one hour that each attorney has for the preservation of evidence. And I just mentioned that it would be good to use an overhead projector to have the jurors concentrate on the document that the attorney is explaining at that moment. Uh, the loose leaf binder should also contain a table of contents, an outline of the uh, attorney's arguments with references to the particular documents so that the jurors later can turn to the relevant one, uh, any uh, uh, agreed statement of facts, and any collation of facts and dates like the medical record review service used to do. You uh, may remind the jury of arguments then and explain the import of the documents. The jury may rely on any documents in their binders, even if they were not mentioned by the attorney. And it's discretionary in the judge whether he will grant the plaintiff a 10-minute rebuttal for the presentation of evidence after the defense is finished. Notice, however, typically, attorneys do not use their whole hour, which may be good because you don't want to lose the jury by becoming verbose. Step four are the 10-minute summations. These occur immediately after the presentation of the evidence. Judge Karasi says, through all the pretrial procedures, you know exactly what the arguments and evidence of the other side are. You don't need more time. You should be prepared. However, there are handy excuses for getting a, an extra 10 minutes. You need to go to the bathroom. You negotiate with the other side. You want to allow the jurors uh, time to read the documents before the summations. Step five. The jurors may submit questions to the court uh, for the attorneys. If approved, if approved, there are uh, the attorneys are allowed two minutes. However, such questions are rare. Step six is the abbreviated charge by the judge. He takes a, you know the pattern jury instructions into account, but they're much shorter. Step seven: the deliberations by the jury. They get the charge and the verdict sheet to take in with them, plus of course the loose leaf binders. The court will pick the alternate jury juror at random then. Uh, seven are picked initially, of course, only six serve. Uh, that seventh can participate in the discussions and the deliberations, but not vote, with the agreement of both parties, but of course, uh, such a jury usually wants to go home. Uh, there, conceivably, the jury would deliberate so long that they would have to come back the next day. So then we uh, turn to step eight, which is the verdict. There's a binding judgment or an exchange of stipulations, depending on whether you have the Chautauqua model or the uh, Bronx model. In a non-binding summary jury trial, there's no record, no stenographer, and no one may use the proceedings in a further proceeding. However, a settlement conference will be scheduled in 30 days. Step nine, uh, post-trial motions. Uh, some are possible, but not one for a directed verdict and not uh, for a uh, judgment against that, deciding that the verdict was against the weight of the evidence. Step 10 is the judgment. Uh, there's a judgment per se in the Chautauqua model. In the Bronx model, there's no judgment. and said the exchange of general leases and stipulations of discontinuance. Step 11 is the appeal. Again, in the Bronx, there is none. However, Chautauqua allows four limited grounds for appeals. The first is corruption, fraud, or misconduct in procuring the award. You know, somebody's been bribed. The second is a miscalculation of figures or a mistake in the description of any person, thing, or property referred to in the award. The jurors made a mistake in arithmetic, or they didn't describe the real property you want title to properly. C is the award being imperfect, the third one is the award being imperfect in a matter of form, not affecting the merits of the controversy. I could never figure out what this meant. I called my friend um, Bill Buckley at Garberini and Share. He handles appeals there. He can't figure out what it meant. I talked to Judge Jurassic on the telephone today. He doesn't know what it means. Somebody in some committee somewhere in the process thought that this would be a good idea. The fourth and final ground is an error of law that occurred during the course of the trial. 
Again, not the weight of the evidence, but an error such as Judge Rossi made in that, that one case in admitting an unsworn video without cross-examination. There are advantages to the summary jury trial in suitable cases. Let's talk about advantages to the courts, to the parties, and to the law firms. First, to the courts. In the summary jury trial itself, that gets the trial shorter and that gets the uh, trial scheduled sooner. The court can also prompt settlement by focusing the parties on the case, on negotiations, sooner in the process. In the regular trials, there's an advantage in having summary jury trials because summary jury trials clear the calendar, and therefore you advance the dates of regular jury trials. Chautauqua found that it was able to dispose of 101 more cases in a year. The backlog went down from 593 cases to 375. There are advantages to the parties. It preserves the right to to a jury trial. The summary jury trial resolves cases sooner. My friend Tom Principe at the medical malpractice firm Kramer Diloff actually once tried a medical malpractice case 13 years after the event. The plaintiff had already died from unrelated causes. He had to use a secretary to read the plaintiff's uh, deposition. It also reduces the cost of preparing and calling witnesses, especially expert witnesses, and the time spent and billed on the defense for the attorneys relearning the case after some considerable time has passed when you finally have a trial. The results are neutral between plaintiffs and defendants. They're 50-50 when you take high-low agreements into account. There are also advantages to the law firms. Resolves cases sooner, a summer jury trial also resolves cases without relearning the case. You can plan for them or move for them shortly after the motion for summary judgment. You can train associates this way. You can have a better educated juror because uh, those better educated jurors won't be excused. They'll be kept for one day. An associate, a young associate could say, uh, listen, we have this case. It's been here a long time. We've got to dispose of it. It's not really complicated, but we just have to resolve it. Mr. So-and-so, our retired partner, was here last week for that luncheon. I could tell he's bored out of his mind. He would love to come back, I'm sure, and try several summary jury cases for us, and I could help him. I know about the books, and I go to CLE lectures. I could even do one myself. Pick an appropriate one, negotiate a high-low agreement. How much damage could I do? So there's an advantage to the firm. There also... Have, we also have to deal with cases that are suitable for a summary jury trial. We'll start with the cases that aren't suitable. Cases with complex issues of uh, fact or law, with uh, complex issues of credibility, uh, you, you would require more witnesses to prove or disprove a fact. Also, cases with a heavy reliance on interpreters. I've only dealt with interpreters as a conference attorney at the family court. But I understand that uh, trying to cross-examine a witness through an interpreter is one of those experiences you'd also, you should offer up for the souls in purgatory. Cases that are generally suitable are where ones where they're, that are legally straightforward or factually straightforward, such as a rear-end auto accident. And those in which there's only liability or damages uh, really at issue. And a non-binding summary jury trial the trial serves as a reality check for negotiations. A binding summary jury trial can be especially suitable when there are a small number of witnesses, the, the offer and demand are close, when a high-low agreement is possible. Uh, the court has to approve a high-low agreement for an infant, not the surrogate's court, the Supreme Court that's trying the case. I have two other advantages. Uh, the plaintiff is elderly or a terminally ill person who needs the matter resolved. If the plaintiff is elderly or terminally ill, then you want to get a summary jury trial because you can get it faster. There'll be also cases where the defendant was that way, I suppose. Another is when the law firm needs to resolve a case ethically that has just been around the office too long. 
so those are the cases in which a summary jury trial is suitable. We can turn then to the initiation of the summary jury trial, the, the pretrial procedure. I'll deal with the non-binding trial, with a binding summary jury trial, with the judge coordinating the details. Uh, the judge may order a non-binding summary jury trial as an aid to settlement. That's simple. A binding summary jury trial results with a stipulation between the parties. The uh, Queens County now says that parties that want a summary jury trial should give the court at least eight weeks notice for the before the trial date. That is, the, the date had already been scheduled for a regular trial. The attorneys generally sign the stipulation. However, some counties require the client also to sign the stipulation. This precludes recriminations. There was a recent case in the Appellate Division, Second Department, O versus Gino, in which the plaintiff changed attorneys and the new attorney said, well, we don't want the summary jury trial. The trial court agreed, but the Appellate Division, Second Department, no, this is a contract. You agreed to it. Your attorney had the apparent authority to enter in this, uh, into this stipulation. But it would probably be better if you got the uh, client's signature, too. It's uh, confirmed on the record that you want a summary jury trial. And, of course, you may negotiate ahead of time on w- the, which issues will be tried, variations, admissibility, before agreeing to that stipulation. The judge, then, coordinates the details. He... Um, he takes the uh, submissions according to schedule. Uh, Bronx County has uh, really a schedule of uh, two submissions. Uh, 30 days before the trial, you serve the documents. 10 days before the trial, you serve objections, a witness list, request to charge, verdict sheet. And the judge conducts an evidentiary hearing. Chautauqua has a three-step process. The judge sets the date for the trial. Chautauqua says it'll be 40 to 90 days. The Bronx says 50. Okay, Kevin, we're going to continue your discussion of the summary jury trial in part two of this broadcast a week from today. And also a podcast of this or the subsequent program can be found at nccradio.org. The code for attorneys who want CLE for part one is BHNCC. That's B as in boy, H-N-C-C. If you've missed any part of this portion or you want to tell someone else about it, just go to the podcast at nccradio.org. And join us next week at, at this same time for the continuation of this program with Kevin P. McMullen on Law You Should Know on 90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nass Community College.